My name is Sierra McKissick and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Hyde Park Art Center. We're really excited to be joined by some wonderful artists from our ceramics department. Um, we're going to have a virtual roundtable discussion with our 2020 and 2021 ceramic apprentices, Tran Tran and Lola Ogbara, in conversation with our ceramics head, Angela Diefenbach, and assistant ceramics head, Joseph Kraft. Um, this talk, as I said before, is in conjunction with Tran Tran's exhibition, Moments in Between, which is now on view at the Hyde Park Art Center. But before we jump into our conversation tonight, I'd like to welcome you all by offering a land acknowledgement as a small way to recognize and respect indigenous people as traditional stewards of the land we occupy and their enduring relationship to it. We want to acknowledge that the Hyde Park Art Center has lived its entire 81 year history on traditional indigenous land. All of the Hyde Park Art Center's many locations have resided on the traditional territory of peoples, including the Peoria, Miami, Potawatomi, and Council of Three Fires. Tonight, we are gathered here virtually and from across the country. So wherever you are, we invite you to learn more about the land where you live, work, and play. My colleagues have put the link in the chat. I'll put that in there later so that you can find resources on how to find out what this land comes from and where you reside as well too. But thank you all so much for joining us. I'll tell you a bit about the exhibition. Moments in Between presents new work by interdisciplinary artist Tran Tran made during their year long ceramics apprenticeship at the Art Center in 2020. The body of work in the exhibition exemplifies Tran's unique approach to ceramics, which both informs and is informed by the artist's ongoing explorations of form across media. Distinct organic forms appear repeatedly in several works in the exhibition, sometimes as artificial intelligence generated images, drawings, and sculptures. The artists use the process of iterating as an essential component of their practice that allows them to investigate how forms evolve through repetition, through the body of work exhibited. Tran invites us to consider how do we differentiate what is singular from what is a part of a whole? Does the essence of a moment, a place, an object, or a person lie in their physical or spiritual quality, a combination of both or beyond them entirely? Our ceramics apprenticeship program provides a unique opportunity for ceramic artists to work in a community-based art center during the course of a year. The apprentice receives training by the ceramics department head and the assistant head of ceramics in advanced studio skills while developing their work in a supportive environment. The exhibition by Tran Tran is curated by Mariela Acuna, exhibitions and residency coordinator in collaboration with Tran also. And with that, I will hand it over to Tran to talk a bit more about their exhibition and their work as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. OK, awesome. All right. Um, so thank you so much for tuning in tonight uh, for our talk. And also, thank you again if you have seen the work in person. Um, my name is Tran Tran. My first name and last name are the same. Um, a little bit about myself. I um, grew up in Vietnam and moved to San Jose, California when I was about 10. That was in 2007. Um, and from there, I um, got my pictorial arts um, um, degree um, from San Jose State University. Um, it was a concentration in painting and um, prints making. And um, very soon after I graduated um, in 2018, my partner and I moved to Chicago. And with a stroke, stroke of luck, we were, um, our apartment white, right, was right across the street from High Park Art Center. And when I was looking for um, a job, I applied there to help with photography and marketing. And um, so once I started working, I was allowed to take a free class. And my first class that I took at High Park Art Center was with Joe Craft. Um, so in the beginning, when I first started taking ceramics, all I wanted to do was to make bowls and cups. I thought it was just gonna be just like a fun thing and that I would just keep painting, but I felt 
like deeply, deeply in love with clay. And I just, um, just like was completely drawn, like drawn myself into clay. And soon after, I think it was in um, September of 2019, that was when the Angela and Joe um, started the apprenticeship program at High Park Art Center. And um, with a lot of encouragement from Joe and Lori Bartman, a ceramic student at, or community member in the ceramic studio, I applied. And um, in the beginning when I started, I just wanted to make um, a lot of like freestanding sculptures. Um, but when the, ceram uh, when the pandemic hit my work, really changed my work with ceramics really changed because um, I found um, this program called uh, Art Reader. It's a free website um, that uses artificial intelligence to generate images. Um, I will show you like I will demonstrate a little bit um, with using the website and explain a little bit more about Art Reader and how I generate these images. But once I found out about, um, let me show this slide of, for example, like some of these work are in the exhibition. These uh, images are used, um, I use um, Art Reader um, to generate these images. And um, while I generate them, I felt like I wanted to bring my um, connection with painting and um, printmaking and drawing back and like tie it back into making clay. And so I kind of turn away from tr wanting to make um, free form sculptures work, but start making more like slap work um, like these. And um, basically I roll out a slab and then I would just um, kind of use techniques, use gl uh, glaze and under glaze and um, or kind of use the uh, little bits of clay to make visual elements that kind of connect back to my painting and printmaking background. But also using the um, new forms that I found while I was generating images in Art Reader and tie that back in. Um, and from that, once I start making both at the same time, generating images um, using AI and then also making ceramics work that use those images, eventually they kind of start merging. And um, I wanted to just kind of um, blend them together so that I uh, would it, it, um, iterate the uh, forms I use in both. So once I, while I'm generating AI images, I would try to look for um, uh, visual symbols that I feel that I've made using clay. And so they, it becomes kind of like a loop of um, symbols that keep like recycling and then changing. And for this work, I use a drawing I made uh, on the left and then merge it with an image I made on the right. So um, the image was actually a photograph or like a scan of a ceramic piece that I made. And um, so then I, the scan of it, the image scan of the ceramics, I use it and like put it in Illustrator and together merging them, I was able to create the middle image. Um, to me, this is important because in my work, I constantly trying to find this bridge to gap, like this, um, the nuances in between, to me, what is like magic and like the immaterial quality of everything with the material, like the physical object of everything that or like the vessel of everything. So um, so this was why I like con continuously trying to um, generate images that um, just uh, seem like they're in kind of in the middle of 
trans, um, transforming or just like duplicating itself. In the exhibition, all of the work are shown in like groupings or some of them are shown in groupings and some of, of them are shown by themselves. But, um, but they, I also see them as individuals. And um, like, to me, some of them are families and they're like connected to each other, but some of them are just, um, just can be viewed um, by themselves. <laughs> Sorry. And I think with that, I'll just um, let Joe start. I don't know if Joe can hear me. I can hear you. Okay. Can you go to the, yeah, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Tran. That was a, a great insight into the work and also a little bit about the apprenticeship. And, you know, it's interesting to think about how the work changed because of the pandemic. And that kind of ties into like a little bit of my introduction. So my name is Joe Kraft. I'm the assistant head of ceramics at the Hyde Park Art Center. And I would consider, you know, my, my background is in ceramics. I would consider myself a visual artist and designer. And, you know, the, the word designer is kind of new for me in, in terms of calling myself that. And I would say maybe a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have been using that word to describe my artistic practice. And just as Tran was talking about how the work started to slowly change because of the pandemic and due to like not having access to a studio, I think our artistic process, like we, we have our, our voice and we build some sort of vocabulary and but over time that changes and we change. And so how we describe ourselves as creatives, we are allowed to change that. And I think sometimes we can kind of pigeonhole ourselves in, in what our pro or what we think our process is. And we actually are so much more than that. Um, like I just said, ceramics is my background, but I'm much more than maybe just the clay that I, I make work out of. So. The first two images are, are prints. I have been drawing my whole life. So image has been something that's been very important to me since I've been a little kid. And I would say that with the imagery, I, I try to reflect on my own personal narrative. And but my own narrative is other people's narratives or we all relate as humans. So I try to take my own personal experiences and, and use that as inspiration and to, in, a, in an attempt to try to reflect on like the universal truth or the, the universal things that we all experience in life. Um, so the one on the left is called breathe easy, tomorrow's another day. And it's about the image, but it's also very much about the title. And we can't control what we do every single day of our lives, but we have to know that tomorrow is another day and we keep moving forward. I would say within the work I'm making right now, whether it be ceramic or printmaking, the image and the meaning behind the image is the most important aspect. So I want people to relate to what I'm creating and, and find themselves within the work. And whether it be kind of like a sarcastic, funny under, undertone or like a serious emotional reaction to the work. And then the piece on the left is called Been on the Run My Whole Life. And it's kind of this idea like, well, we're just moving every day and I'm trying to figure out what the hell I'm doing. And, and there's days where you really feel grounded and purposeful within your actions or your work or your, your friendships or relationships. And then the next day that kind of can tumble away and feel 
like it's uh, so far away from you. Um, so I tend to have these kind of, you know, personal insights in my life. And then I try to think about how I can create some sort of image and put that out into the world to share. Um, printmaking, I got into after, so I went to college for ceramics and that's what I focused on um, material wise while I was in school. And I got into printmaking after school when I was a resident at Lill Street Art Center, which is up North. Um, and so I think that also ties into like the, how great and meaningful like community art centers are. Like Tran, you found ceramics at the art center in Hyde Park. I found printmaking at another one. And like, there are these, there are these umbrellas of support in so many different ways that provide us uh, the opportunity to grow. Um, we, we walk in thinking we know what we want maybe. And you know, you walk in and there's so much more opportunity there and available to you. Um, so uh, in terms of like how some of these shapes come together, like my background is, or I, I think a lot about my work as being abstract. And of course these are um, representational to hands and feet, but I, I want the work to be somewhat abstract and, and built with shapes. And I think a lot about architecture and how simple shapes and shadows create structure. So that's something I think a lot about when I'm outside of the idea, but how the um, aesthetic and, and visual component comes together. Okay, Tran, you can go to the next slide. So these are two ceramic pieces. And like I said, imagery is really important to me. And, and really drawing is at the root of my work, whether it's printmaking or ceramics. I'm always thinking about how I can draw with material. And, you know, Tran had talked about recycling imagery. And I, I think a lot about that in my work. It's very cyclical and, and the imagery responds or I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make something out of clay and use some sort of imagery and that I then respond to with printmaking. So I think a lot about a vocabulary, like who, what is Joe Craft's vocabulary and how can I really define and refine it over time and ultimately have it be this like kind of universally recognizable image. Um, so the piece on the left is called, You've Got a Light in Your Eye. And it's essentially like a, a coil ceramic piece. Like it was extruded. So I did a drawing and then laid the clay down on the paper and then fired it. And uh, I've been using the, the image of like the candle a lot in my work lately. Um, some of it has to do with just like self care and the idea of lighting a candle and like creating some sort of mood, but it's also about passage of time and um, some deeper ideas, but uh, yeah, that, that piece I was really happy with and it was kind of a happy accident. I mean, I knew I wanted the candles to be right in the glasses. And again, this is like a little bit of self narrative and you know, this, there, this is me, but it's also other people. Um, but yeah, when I lit the candles, like the eyes really glowed up and I was like, oh, that's, that's awesome. Happy accidents with, I mean, I think that's why we create, right? Like we want some sort of constant variable that we know is going to work, but then it's the happy accidents that really continue to drive us uh, forward. You know, Tran, you even brought that up as you were laying out your show. You know, you'd seen the work for so long in the studio and then in the hallway and that really got, um, that was the, an opportunity to really see the work in a new light. Um, and then the piece on the right is uh, like a large vase. Uh, I tend to, I like to work really quick when I work in clay, which is very opposite of how I work in printmaking. Um, so the, the vessels tend to be kind of quick and crude and I love to show the pinch marks. And this piece also, again, talks about, or uh, uses the vocabulary that I've built over time. Um, I, the clay work that, uh, vessel wise tends to be a canvas for me to draw on and represent 
some of the imagery. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. That was really insightful. Um, uh, so uh, I would say I'm opposite of Joe. I make my work really, really slowly. Um, though I do relate a lot to um, both what Tran and, and Joe were talking about with the passage of time. Um, so I'm interested in both old and new medical concepts, how these impact our relationship with the natural world, animals, ethics, old treatments becoming new again, um, post-natural concepts, and specifically the merging of otherwise divergent genetic domains, and how this is often obscured or ignored. Um, I also am interested in like this give and take of breakthroughs and like irony within the medical industry. So the image on the left came about thinking about um, post-natural beings, um, things that have been altered, um, and like non-Western medicine being used in like a modern medical treatment. Um, for example, uh, the use of frogs and toads for treatments of heart issues. Um, I should also like, I want to also like think about what Joe was talking about with um, how artists often wear multiple hats in their practice and how we're not just one thing. And I relate to that in that I do a lot of research before I even begin a project. Um, some of the things I work on take me years um, just because I'm reading medical and medical um, journals and take a lot of notes. I feel like a reading and researching is a huge part of my practice outside of what I do inside this, the ceramic studio. Um, and then the image on the right is part of an ongoing like imagining and thoughtfulness about the hygiene hypothesis, which is um, the idea that uh, we're living in a very clean or perhaps an overly clean environment and that this has perhaps led to some health issues. For example, um, folks who have overly active immune systems, allergies, that type of thing. Um, I also like to think a lot about um, and focus on farming and animals that you see um, and plants in like a rural setting. I am from uh, a very rural area, uh, lots of farming happening around me. And I use that as a way to kind of contextualize my current practice. Uh, I also think that farming is a really excellent example of the use of control over the natural world. And also like, I'm really interested in transgenic organisms and probably the most famous examples of transgenic organisms would be, um, corn and soy. So these are organisms that have been, have their genomes altered to be weed resistant, right? Um, okay, you can go on to the next slide, Tran. And then this piece is older, but oh, it's be, I feel like it's become so much more relevant and I feel like I understand it better now currently with the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this piece is exploring the cyclical nature of medicine using the medical mask as like an icon. So the image on the left, you see more of the typical surgical mask. And then the one on the right is showing a plague mask. I'm like, I think this is a really great example of like the cyclical types of um, issues kind of come up and similar also ideas of how to solve um, these types of problems also just the cycle that that it creates. Um, and I will turn it over to last but not least, Lola. Hi. Um, okay, so my name is Lola Akbara. I am um, an artist and cultural worker from Chicago, Illinois, and currently based here in the city as well. Um, I work with an array of mediums, my primary medium being ceramic sculpture, um, which is accompanied by 
photography, um, sound, uh, so many other things, uh, and, and, and fiber arts. And so as an artist, my I, identity is based primarily in the intersections of blackness, queerness, and womanhood. And so my practice becomes a way in which I process these circumstances um, that is, you know, that are situated within this identity, whether occurring in the past, the present, or the future. And so a lot of the themes in my work kind of revolve around identity, gender, sexuality, um, and the body. And so I'm always kind of examining the tensions surrounding all of these themes. Um, one of those tensions being hypervisibility um, and invisibility, as well as strength and fragility associated with identity, um, particularly Black feminine identity. And so using ceramic sculpture as well as photography and sound to form installations, um, I'm always exploring the implications surrounding the body, surrounding gender and surrounding race, um, mostly in the context of, of racialized voyeurism. And so the body tends to come up in my work a lot. Um, the body as well as the, the absence um, of the body. Um, and I contemplate complexities of labor, pleasure, and desire um, as a search for, for due process, if you will. Um, but through the materials that I'm, I'm using and the compositions that I choose to use, I'm primarily emphasizing on the uh, connection between Western colonialization and how Black identities are able to see themselves um, in this world. And so a lot of the work that I'm currently doing um, in ceramic arts is in the form of vessels, not, necessary, not necessarily vases or, or objects of that sort, but vessels in which become, I guess, bodily or non-bodily in a sense. Um, the image that you see on your screen currently uh, is a photo of one of my newest works, um, A Bellow of Laughter, um, part one. Um, this has glazed stoneware on it and the dimensions are seen on the screen as well. Um, but this represents the direction I'm interested in going with ceramic works. Um, like Angela, a lot of the work starts with research and a lot of research and a lot of reading and so with that being said, the new, I guess, direction I'm interested in heading towards involves um, a kind of marriage of ceramics and, and sound art. And so thinking about sound, I'm also thinking about the, uh, the work or the ceramic art that I'm creating as vessels for sound or instruments, if you will. And so with this, I'm creating kind of openings or cavity openings within the work itself to become sort of a speaker or an outlet for the sound to exit. I'm also thinking about how to construct these vessels in a way that makes that process easy or, or attainable in a sense. And so a lot of the work I'm doing at the ceramic um, apprenticeship at High Park Art Center is, is surrounding that, that construction of the vessel and, and kind of deconstructing the ways I'm going about constructing the work. Um, and so a lot of the references I'm using within the work um, is taken from literature, music, pop culture, as well as my own life and my um, more particularly um, my uh, childlike references or my nostalgic references or my youth. Um, and so 
with this work that you see on the screen, um, a bellow of my laughter enters the realm of um, otherness, otherness kind of projected from, let's see, from scientific references or historic references that kind of place the black body in the other category. Um, something that's seen as abnormal or um, outside of, of Western uh, social, you know, socialized communities. And so taking that otherness, I'm wanting to or aiming to kind of subvert that in a sense um, by using surfaces that enter, you know, a ethereal theme or, a, um, or an aesthetic. And so the glaze that you see here that I've used is more so a glaze that may look like a galaxy or a universe, um, but it also resembles, um, in my opinion, um, something you would see under um, a microscopic kind of situation or, 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 or a petri dish, something you would see in a petri dish. And so taking these elements of disdain towards you know, race or sexuality um, and gender, um, kind of in a way subverting that and creating things that are in a sense in my opinion, ugly beautiful is what I call it. Something that is that straddles the fence of ugliness and, and beauty simultaneously. If you can go to the next slide for me, please. Um, the current work that you are seeing on your screen now, it's titled If You Can't Be Free, Be a Mystery. Um, this work kind of represents the work that I've been doing over the past three to four years, um, particularly talking about the Black body and how, how hyper visual it is in society. And so playing again uh, on those tensions of hyper visibility and invisibility, um, I'm thinking about refusal disruption um, and confrontation. And so a lot of the vessels that I tend to create may look like parts of the body, but more obscured in a sense. Um, so there's that, that bodily reference and non-bodily reference um, that you see within the work. I'm also interested in disruption is, of the gaze. And so knowing how my identity is perceived in the world um, and how I navigate those circumstances. I'm, I'm interested in, in kind of implicating the gays um, and implicating people in that voyeurism. And so a lot of the work becomes a way that I, I kind of challenge viewership in a way. Um, outside of ceramic arts, the work becomes very obscured um, and, and confrontational. Um, as far as my photography goes, I'm interested in parts of the body that may look familiar, um, but unfamiliar at the same time. So there is a sense of uncanniness um, that's throughout all all mediums um, that I'm, I'm using within the within my practice. I'm also thinking about um, survival apparatuses, laughter, um, and how people think they know black features, um, but they really don't. And so playing off that 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 fake awareness in a sense, um, I'm always kind of challenging the viewer to to, or maybe an invitation to, to look a bit deeper within the work. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's about it. 
Thank you everyone for sharing about your practices. I think now we're going to jump into some conversation around the ceramics apprenticeship and the overlaps between your work and your practices as well. Yeah, let's talk a bit about the show a bit more, um, Trina. I would love to hear just more of your inspiration behind what went into it and how the ceramics apprenticeship um, really helped inspire that as well, especially knowing that you took your first class with Joe and uh, kind of evolved into this process. I would love to hear a bit more about that and how the Art Center helped transform that. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, uh, Sierra. Um, so when I think like the, the biggest thing that I learned from Joe is like, like his perspective of seeing clay as like a canvas and like his background in illustrate like in illustration and drawing and his practice um, and drawing like symbols and um, his own like vocabulary um, onto the clay really spoke to me and like how I use like how I was painting. And um, also like the way he think of clay is like he doesn't want it to be perfect. And um, that like you can just like hand build instead of throwing and and I think like when I started with like throwing, it feels like in the beginning, it was like very fun and meditative, but I think eventually it felt kind of like an, uh, a prison for me because it, everything was like kind of the same form. And then once I started to hand build and learning from Joe, um, it like kind of opened me up to like a lot more to the way that I can um, explore like how I can use clay as like a canvas or um, just like a template for me to start like drawing or painting on with clay, with glaze or under glaze. And, um, and also like working in the studio and seeing like the way other community members use clay, uh, glaze um, also like really inspired me because they like, instead of just like dunking it into um, like, like lazing a bowl, for example, just instead of dunking it into just one color, they're like drawing with it. And for me, that's very exciting um, and really shift my perspective on how I saw ceramics. Um, and maybe I'll share my screen again so I can show, um, talk more specifically about this one work that really demonstrate how um, working in the studio really influenced my work. So the work on the right here, um, Rhythm of a Puddle, for, um, there was a, a community member and teacher, Cheryl. Um, she makes this clay called uh, Green to Black. And we, we kind of also like nicknamed it Cheryl's Glaze, but um, it has um, these like nuances, like depending on the firing and um, just um, how thick the thickness of it and where you place it in the kiln, it creates like these in like very strange nuances. It can be orange, it can be deep, like shiny black, um, or it can be like green. And um, it was like the glaze that I was really searching, like the effects that I was really searching for a while. And um, it wasn't until like we started like making um, the glaze chart in the studio that I realized the, the range that it has and like start using it in my work. So I, a lot of these work, I can't imagine how they would be without being in a shared studio space. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just a huge influence on my work. And then also I forgot um, who it was that showed me this, um, uh, like drawing pen, like a drawing tool that sucks up glaze and then you draw with it. 
And it really changed the way I use glaze like too, because um, I start using it and like drawing with it more all these uh, asymmetric uh, forms um, that that um, it was like a lot harder to use with brush. And um, that tool allowed me a lot of freedom to like use glaze in a way that I previously used paintings. Um, so yeah, like I think um, whenever I look at my work, especially looking at, at up on the gallery wall, like I think about like the influences of like each community members, like, like how that really changed my work. And um, yeah, I'm just like very grateful to be in this space and with everyone and like learning from everyone. So yeah, um, I kind of forgot what the full question was. So let me know if I didn't get to answer it completely. I actually, I have a question to kind of tack on to what Sierra had, um, asked and also Tran what you had just talked about so you know we we've been talking about how ceramics ceramics in general is a very community-based material that is why like when at art centers ceramics tends to be this really popular material to work in because it does require a group of people to really make make it happen so I was wondering um what have, what has learning from others and also being a leader in the studio taught you? Because over, you, over time you became, you went from a student to being the apprentice and, and a monitor. So you took on a role of, of a leader in the studio as well. So I'm, I'm curious to know what that has taught you. Not only have you learned from people, but people have learned from you. Um, I think it's so strange, but like, I, I so rarely see myself as a leader that, that like, even when I got the role of the, um, apprentice, I still felt like I was just, when I'm talking to community members or they came with me, came to me for questions around about the space and how to make something or use the glaze, I still felt like they're just like, cause I started out as, as a student and like, and I learned with everyone in the space. So then I still just felt like they were my friend and, and I just like communicated with them. And I feel like the way I communicated, it, it's like kind of like became more of like a conversation. And I also learned from Angela and you, like the way you guys communicate, it always feel like you guys weren't like really teachers, but you guys just like are friends with the student. And somehow I feel like that, that just make it, it's just like a conversation all the time of just like, hey, like, oh, like we're sharing things and we're sharing like all these knowledge we know about clays, uh, clay and glaze. And we, it's like a conversation that gets you excited. And instead of just feeling like, oh, I'm like, I'm talking to someone to like teach them or something. And like, they feel like, okay, I receive information and like, it's less of a conversation, but, but it's like constantly just like, oh, like I'm excited about this. Like, do you see this? Like, can uh, like this, the way this glaze like affect the, like during this firing and then they like, oh, how about this? And like, what if we use this in combination together? So I think that's like the most exciting thing that I've learned. Yeah, it's the materials just so complex and there's so many opportunities that arise throughout the vast process of ceramics for those conversations and connections to happen. Like hearing both Tran and Lola talk about their insight into glaze. Well, even Angela too, like, you know, Tran, you're, you're speaking about this complex glaze that we added to the studio last year. And, and that has, not defined your work, but it's definitely added to the voice of, of how the work came together. And then to hear also Lola speak on the, the glaze that reminded her of um, like a galaxy. Like we not only are working out and seeking or like working out our ideas and then 
um, constructing them within these forms, but then this whole added layer after that is, is how we finish the work. And that is complex. Like that is a complex process. So I think that's what's so great about community is because you can really kind of tap in and articulate these little ideas all along the way um, because it's really hard to do it all on your own. Yeah. And, and I feel like there's, there's just like so many, also so many problems that comes with glazing and with yeah. clay that like, when, if you ha are like left alone to solve these things, it's very like, I would be lost. Um, like there's, there would be like glaze, um, glazing issues like that that happened to one of my piece and I had no idea what was going on. And I feel like I wouldn't have known like where to look if like Angela wasn't teaching a glaze class. And then I could just ask Angela like what's going on with this piece. Um, and then from that, I was able to like identify when I was like unloading the kiln and be able to like tell someone else when that defect was happening to their work. Um, maybe I should talk a little bit about how I generate these um, AI images because um, yeah. while I was putting up the show, um, some people were asking me and um, I said I would do a demonstration, but um, let me know if that's something everyone would be interested in. Yeah, definitely. I do have a question though about yeah. how much of your body you put into your work. I feel like working in ceramics is such a, a tactile, like not full body kind of experience, but it's definitely like involved with the hands and like motion and movement, especially um, the work that you all were talking about and Lola, how you incorporate gender in the body into the work. But I'm just curious across the board, um, outside of like making figurative things, like I've been talking to a lot of artists about being in their body when they're making and creating and how that manifests itself into the work. So I'm just curious um, about that. If Lola, that you want to go first or? Sure, sure. Um, the body for me, it's, it's I don't know, it's something that, that happens quite naturally. Um, and maybe because I'm always thinking about, I guess, myself in relation to the people who've made me. And so when I'm creating works of any kind and I'm thinking about the body, I'm also thinking about um, my ancestors and I'm thinking about my grandmother and my mother and my, you know, my great grandmother and my aunts um, and they enter the work as well. And so a lot of the forms that you see have very, much so uh, a sense of excess flesh or um, a sense of corpulence added to it. Um, and I think that just comes from my nostalgic kind of recollection of being near my family and being with my family, um, you know, as a, as a, as a kid. And, and having my grandmother scoop me up in her arms or, you know, whether I'm sitting in her lap and she's doing my hair or, you know, what have you. I'm, I'm always thinking about these moments. And, and so I'm thinking about the closeness that comes with that. And so the body and, and as well as gender, as well as sexuality is something that happens quite naturally within the work. Um, and and I, not often do I, I I sit to think about, I'm just, you know, I'm just working. So when I'm working with ceramic arts, um, it becomes an intuitive process. I like to think that um, it's, I'm a vessel myself um, for whatever feels like needs to be here in this life, whatever feels like you know, needs to be presented. I'm, I'm just a vessel for that, for that to come through. Um, yeah. 
I definitely relate to the idea of intuitiveness when it comes to working with clay because it is so responsive to our touch. And like I was saying earlier with the vessels that I make, I tend to work pretty quickly uh, and, and fast. And, and I want to see the work be created pretty quickly and, and live in that moment where it can kind of move and collapse and know that I don't have really full control over what I'm doing. But at the same time, I, I know fully well, like I do have control and I like to live in that moment of working very quickly. And, you know, like I just said, like clay is so malleable and responsive to our touch. Like it, it talks right back to us. I mean, I guess art in general can, can do that, but clay because of its tactile nature um, lets you live in that moment of, of constructing. Yeah, I, I like also want to echo that and like that I, whenever I'm making like a slab or just like building like um, elements, like visual elements onto a slab, um, it feels like, oh, sorry, <laughs> I don't know how to go back, um, but every time I'm like working and like trying to build visual elements on a slab or just trying to make the slab like stable and make sure that it can hold the firings because like slabs tend to crack, like Joe taught me. Um, I feel like I have to like hammer it out and just like feel like every time I'm like making a slab, I feel like I'm channeling. There's like a funnel that I have to like channel my whole presence into into like being there and making sure like just like hammer it and just like pound it so it's like a very full body and mind experience and just to make sure that there's no bubbles and or just like make sure that it has all these like textile tactile quality of my palm and I don't know something about it is very um rewarding for me it's almost like a workout um but yeah, it's definitely once I'm, I'm done making a slab, I have to like take a break because it's just like exhaust me. <laughs> yeah, it's also painful sometimes. I'm like, why do I do this to myself? I mean, really like in terms of looking at the scale of the slabs or any of the work that any of us showed today um, or this evening, scale, I mean, just working with the material you can work very intimately and small but as soon as it starts to grow like on a physical level it it wears you out and i mean there is that like precious moment when you're like really body to bottle like that that bodily experience where it, it it the work can get big enough where it does reflect your own scale and and there's something that's really beautiful about that but on on the other side it it's it wears you out <laughs> yeah so to piggyback on what joe was saying is like sometimes i feel like my body is my limitation um i always want to try to be independent in the studio whenever i can and when i can't move something by myself anymore it becomes problematic um a lot of times i like to move pieces by giving it a big bear hug once they get big enough and i feel like that's definitely a very bodily experience uh, the other thing i think is so poignant about your question is that in ceramics the clay that we use we call that all the different clays are different or we call them clay bodies we also use the language of the body to discuss any type of ceramic form in particular functional wear so we have a lip on a bottle, a shoulder, a belly, a foot. It's all very bodily. I think that it's almost impossible to get away from the body when we're working with clay. And it is a very physical experience. I mean, although we're not chopping, chopping wood to load kilns, you have to physically reach inside of the kiln. Sometimes you don't have quite long enough arms and you're really pushing your body sometimes in order to do just what you need to do to get done. I am sore sometimes when I get home. Um, sometimes my workout routine is me trying to make sure that I'm strong enough to lift really heavy shelves or to reach something over because the worst thing you can ever do is accidentally break someone's work because you weren't strong enough to move it correctly. 
The other thing I've noticed with myself when I'm really into my making is that I start to forget my body. Like I don't even feel it. Like a lot of times I'll have to work on something. I'll have to like contort myself down and look up and like be in a really uncomfortable position. And if you ask me to take that position while not working on my work, I'd be like, what are you doing torturing me? Because that hurts. But like, it's almost like working on your body. You almost also forget your own body. Like I, um, I don't experience the pain in the same way. For example, at work, I walked into a door and almost broke my finger. I didn't realize it was swollen until I got home and out of the studio. And I had to like reflect and be like, oh, I think I maybe broke my finger at work earlier. Kat, thank you for sharing that. I think also the titles and names that you use are so related to the body too. And I'm curious, you were about to talk about how AI influences your work, which is so separate from the body also, Tran, um, how that informs the work also. Oh, you're on mute, Tran. Sorry, I haven't presented in a while, so I'm like kind of lost to how like operating this. Let me um, try to reshare my full screen. Okay, let me see. Can everyone see the screen? Yes, okay. So if you, I highly recommend playing with this if you're curious about AI, this is such an awesome website that it's like mind blowing to me that it's free. Um, so when I first played with this, I, I didn't think that I would use it for anything that's related to my practice. And because most people, like I will show you like the main page. Um, most people like, uh, let me see, use them to like generate fake, fake profiles or like fake places. Um, just like things that basically most of these are fake, but you can see like, if you watch Squid Game, then you see that people are like trying to generate a cartoon character of the main people in the Squid Game here. So people use it for something that's like very different than what I'm trying to use it for. But everyone, um, you can like play with the program. Basically, the, the AI program to break it down is just it, um, it uh, someone feeds a set of images to into it. And then it learns the pattern of those images. And for example, you feed in a hundred pictures of clouds and it reads the the like qualities or characteristics of what makes an image looks like clouds and then it can generate its own like set of images that would make like clouds that were not taken in real life but would be very believable but art breeder it used a lot many of those traits and it combines into one image so um, I can show you my profile where I generated. These are a lot of the images I generate. And sometimes I spend like hours, days, just generating and reading images together to make something like to go and to find a pocket that, that really speak to my aesthetic and my, um, my work and makes me feel like it's connecting back to my cer ceramics work or whatever the interest I'm exploring. So for example, my own old work, you can see that it has like more like recognizable qualities, like their eyes and nucleuses and faces. And as I keep generating those images, it becomes more and more like merged and blurred and the quality becomes more distinct, like of, of the, uh, the aesthetic becomes more distinct. Um, and any of these images, for example, these are my new set of images that I'm exploring. Um, like my ceramics work, I'm something that I tend to use a lot in my work is this, um, these symbols that seems to be transforming or that looks like in their transformation, they look like their languages um, or their writings. Um, so 
in that I'm like, I've been exploring like how to make kind of just like um, constantly breeding these images together to create like patterns that looks like uh, writing. And for example, right here, you can read that the genes of each image is like random things like prayer rug, ice bears, pottery, potter wheel. That's like the first time I noticed that. Um, but so like, for example, here, let me adjust the knobs. So you can see how much that changes. And um, sometimes it's just like, I spend hours just like adjusting those things and try to like kind of um, intuitive, intuitively find out like how, like what those things act, like what the visual changes those things actually affect. Um, for ex and like sometimes it's toilet seat, but um, these, yeah, like you can play a lot with the uh, this program and um, usually the images that I generate are super low quality. You can see how blurry they are. The ones that are in the exhibition right now, I actually have to download them, put them through another program that's also AI, but in that program, it blows up the, qual the, the quality. It kind of enh enhance the quality of the image. And then I go into it with Photoshop and like add grain to it. So like it builds up the, um, the digital or like the image quality a little bit more. Um, so that's why some, a lot of the work in the exhibition you can see are able to be printed in a bigger um, size. I don't know if anyone has any question right now regarding this. Um, let me know and then I can go into it more because I can just stay on this all day or like, I don't know which way to like direct you. So I have a question. I, I think I, you did speak about this at the beginning, um, but the AI work definitely has influenced like a lot of some of the mark making that you've been doing on the clay. Yeah. So I, I wonder then is that clay, is the response in clay then responding back into the AI or have you been finding that yeah. being, the AI is the inspiration to for it's the like, clay work? I think I, basically it started with me making like certain um, clay work and then I'm, I was already interested in like the, the motifs that I tend to be drawn to are these symbols that kind of play around with the nuances between the magic or immater immater uh, immaterial quality or the physicalness of an object. So I'm just trying to find all these um, visual elements that would kind of generate this feeling, feeling that like something is in a transition between the immaterial, uh, imma um, sorry the Material. physicalness and the immaterialness of it itself. So, um, so I started drawing those symbols and when I start generating that and I found out that I could like go deeper and deeper into a photo, photo or image and generate it so that it becomes more similar to what I want, then, then, it, um, then I keep doing that and then I start pulling elements that is generated from that and put it into ceramics. But while I'm generating again, like generating AI images, I kind of like try to like uh, push these knobs and buttons and um, just try to put it, pull it back into something that makes, reminds me of um, clay and ceramics. Um, and then just kind of keep that loop going. Let me try to find something that um, kind of respond more to my clay work. Like, like certain shapes that seems to be in between of like transforming into something else completely. Like you, you can't quite tell what they are, um, but you feel like it's like familiar. And um, I think I try to put those shapes back into clay. Um, like for example, sorry, let me, um, for example, like, and here, 
um, this work right here, I like add those certain like little pockets of uh, clay into it that kind of emulate the feeling as if something is also like transforming or moving between two forms. So would you say that some of these titles are reflecting or are reflective in, in the process? So I, Irene asked a question about oh, sorry. The, right, uh, the, the range of, of themes or works here. And, and she said, just curious to hear more about how people think about the title text and if they see it as an important component to the work at all. And I'm glad she asked that because it makes me think, you know, both Lola and Angela spoke a lot about research. And I, I think that your titles possibly are influenced by that research within the work. And then to, to read some of your titles, Tran, um, they might be more influenced on part of the process and how the imagery comes together in that way. So I'm curious to know like Rhythm of a Puddle or Rock's Wings and Spirit Transformed, um, what influenced those titles? For example, for Rock's Wings and Spirit Transform, I, I started with this rock my friend gave me and then I made the imprint right here in the middle. And, um, and then from that imprint, I started making other shapes that kind of emulate the, that imprint. Mm. And so it's, to me, it's kind of this feeling of like something is very physical, but then it becomes something else completely undergoing this process. And um, the title tends to like, I, I really hate naming my work. And, and so it's the title is always the hardest for me. And usually I just let the work like decide hopefully that like that's what it wants like like I don't really um like title title uh like naming them so so I just kind of like hope that that name somehow like come to me after the like I'm done with the piece um and so yeah like my work tends to be more um driven through like my um observe observation of like everyday moments um basically just meditating on like light spots or just things moving around me and interactions and like just like conversations rather than research I think um my work is mostly like um I feel that all of my work tends to just trying to instead of like saying words, it just kind of like, like trying to like, ex the same as me, I'm like really not good with words or research. For me, it's like everything is like through emotion and almost always like trying to communicate in this like projecting like an aura or like my, just like, I'm trying to be like, just projecting my energy rather than words. And I think that, um, that comes from me like growing up like and moving from Vietnam to um, San Jose and like not being able to communicate really well with other kids and then just trying to always to like convey my feeling in like a very expressive way and like energy and like my bodily manners instead of like like with words so I think like that's where t my work tends to too. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> to tack on to like what like Irene was asking, um, I guess I have a very different approach than Tran does um, with the titling. A lot of times I think about the titling as like, it's only really rewarding the interested viewer and like how many people actually look at the title cards or the not, I don't think very many, right? So I always like try to make it be like, um, like a special little like hint at what the work might be. Um, and a lot of times, like for myself, I, I use a lot of scientific um, 
like names and specifically what the piece is about. Because I think sometimes, you know, you want a mystery to your work. You don't want to give it all away. So like, I like to give, use the title as a way to like hint towards like that mystery for the really curious viewer. I'm really interested in rewarding curiosity. And so, for example, that, that piece with the, the pig butts, it's entitled Tictoris Tictura, which is a, um, the scientific name of the whipworm, which is a pig parasite used to treat humans. And so if you Google search Tictura Tictura, you might be able to actually figure out what the heck the piece is about. I would like to add on to that as well. Um, I guess and talk about my relationship to titles and texts, but um, I mentioned earlier that I'm pulling from literature, music, and, and pop culture within the work. Um, and that comes out within the titles I choose to, to title my work with. Um, I think it's a chance to contextualize the work. And so with that, I'm, I'm usually pulling from songs um, or poems. Um, a lot of these songs come from um, hip hop rap. And so knowing that the work itself is pulling from that culture in general, um, more so the bravado that comes with that culture, the bling, the, the very um, flashy and, and very confident kind of, um, kind of aesthetics that come from rap and hip hop music um, and how I'm using that to, to kind of con contextualize the work by using that as um, using bling or rhinestones to adorn the ceramic works. Or, or using chains to, to drape on the pieces or, or what have you. But a lot of it is taken from actual songs that exist, some of them being songs I listen to regularly. Um, a lot of the text is taken from, or the title text is taken from poems. Um, I think the image that I showed, if you can't be free, be a mystery. Um, is a, a, a line from a poem by Rita Dove, um, in which I used, and, and it made sense to use because the mystery within the work itself and, and the, the, I guess the content in which I'm, the subject matter in which I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just, I'm pulling from things that already contextualize the work to kind of further place this work in, you know, more, even more context. Yeah, I definitely relate to that in terms of contextualizing the work. And like, I see the overarching theme is like, all three of you have talked about titles in a very different way, but the, the common theme is like, it felt right, or like, this makes sense. And that's, also like within the work we make, you know, the work makes sense to us. Um, yeah, I, I kind of feel the same way, like especially with like the imagery um, and the print work of mine, like the, the image is so bold and, and graphic and um, visible that I want the, the title to also have this sense of like, feeling and emotion and relatability so like the image of the, the feet running like it's very relatable but been on the run my whole life as as a saying or a title is also very relatable so I want them to both live separately because I think sometimes some of my titles can really pull the viewer in because they might read that and find a connection to being on the run their whole life and then start to view themselves within the work. So I kind of like, and maybe they don't know the title first and they see themselves in the image, but I like that duality of, of, of being able to relate to both um, the title and the actual work. Yeah, thank you, Irene, for that question. It was super generative. It looks like we have about maybe like 10 minutes, nine minutes left. Does anyone else in the audience have any questions? Feel free to ask. Um, definitely would love some feedback from anyone if you'd like to share. 
Otherwise, I would love to hear about your experience working together in this ceramics department. It is very close knit um, at the Hyde Park Art Center. And I think what's been interesting about um, Transshow overlapping with Lola's apprenticeship, you all were able to kind of communicate in a different way because the show got pushed back uh, due to the pandemic and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I would just love to hear any closing reflections you all have. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it, this kind of relates to what we were talking about earlier in terms of community and learning from one another. It's, it's not only nice to see what other people are doing in their processes, but it's also fascinating to just watch how people work too. Um, I think uh, as a creative, there, that's an intimate time to make the work. And, and maybe it's not always intimate, but um, there's times where you're just kind of grinding and, and it's a means to an end to finish something. But there are times where it is very, you're vulnerable and intimate with uh, a new idea or you're really trying to execute it for the first time. And you do bear witness to, to everybody or, or individuals or all of us when we're in those moments. And um, it's kind of unspoken, you know, you don't, no one's saying that they're feeling vulnerable, but there's those, I think that that is like a really beautiful time to be in a group studio like that. And like, you can see kind of the, the thought process uh, occurring when people like Lola, you were working the other day on that new form and like stepping back and looking at it and you know, we, we all know that there's other people in the room, but we're so focused on what we're doing. Um, that, yeah, it's kind of like that saying, like, um, dance like no one's watching. It's kind of, that's kind of, um, tack, not, not tacky, but um, I'm, what's the word I'm thinking of? Anyway, yeah, you like, you're in a moment and, and people are around to bear witness. And I think that's great. I think I think it's interesting working in a communal setting. I think you become more aware of yourself and then of course more aware of others and how other people are working and, and what they are interested in. Uh, I know for me, I think maybe Tran said it the other day that I, I work very fast. And so I'm like noticing like, yeah, yeah, I do. I'm, like, I'm sitting here within maybe a few hours and I have like three or four pieces that I've just- you know, I noticed that too, I was like, oh, you built that piece in half the other day. Yeah, so I'm like, yeah, I do work pretty fast actually. And so it's interesting, you know, it's something I didn't realize before. Um, I was just, you know, when you get in the zone, you're, you're just creating. Um, but when, you know, you're part of a community, then again, you notice things about yourself and as well as the people around you. Um, and the people that work out of the, the Hyde Park Art Center are very, very talented. Um, and, they, and they have these lives outside of clay that you kind of don't know until you end up talking to someone and you don't realize, oh, this, is, this person's a doctor or, you know, this person's retired or, or this person is, is in school right now. And so it was interesting to kind of not only get to know the work and I know for me, being an apprentice and handling the work before I even see who's made it has, has been an interesting process as well. Um, and sort of like this, this guessing game. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's an interesting process. Very, very rewarding, to say the least. Yeah, to kind of piggyback on what um, Lola was saying, I feel like uh, the ceramic studio in some ways is like a great equalizer. Um, it doesn't matter who you are, but you're going to struggle to center your first piece of clay on the wheel. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, how much money you have, what your background is. And I think that part of that is the charm. Like, the, like not that yourself or like your, your history doesn't matter because it certainly does. But like when you're in the ceramic studio, like you're there to make work and everyone wants to see what you're working on. 
and solve problems and bounce ideas off of one another. I find like working in the studio also slows me down. And you might think that's a negative, but a lot of times it ends up being very positive because it, it forces you to reflect. Sometimes you can get like kind of tunnel vision on what you're doing and you need someone to be like, hey, what are you doing and why? And they're like, well, I don't know. So sometimes those, those interactions can be really fruitful. Um, I also want to say, someone mentioned something about um, the intergenerationalness of the studio because we have very young and very old people. Some of the most inspiring artists for me are the kids. Um, they make some really good work. And sometimes I'm thinking like, what am I even doing? I've been doing all the studying and here this five-year-old's got this killer chicken that he just made. Um, so that's my reflection on being in like the, the shared studio space. Yeah, and I feel like also like everyone always like checking in on each other and just like if like people notice when you're like doubting yourself and they're just like, hey, like, like, can I help you through this? Like, talk to me, you know, like, and it's nice. It's like nice to just like have a moment of doubt and just like, like someone's just like, oh, you're just overthinking it. Just do it. Just do it. Like there's so many times I'm in the studio. I'm just like, oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll trash this piece. And then someone's just like, no, just, just keep going. Just keep going. Like, and it's, it's really nice. Like something about that is there's someone always like pushing you and just checking on you and like encouraging you to keep going. Yeah. And I see Nate asked a question about <laughs> the future of AI and how that would impact my work or no, he luckily he just asked how AI would impact my work because I won't be able to explain what would happen in the future of AI. Um, so I think I will definitely keep going and um, explore more and just keep generating more AI work and somehow try to like even more ceramics and AI even more together and like um, just have more of like nuances between the two playing with each other. Um, but, and Nate also asked, how do you think AI will most benefit future artists? I feel like it's a way to like, kind of get you, you just like stop overthinking things sometimes. Like it's, you just get to like play with all these images and then you kind of like, kind of like sketches. They're like sketches and then you get to like decide okay, like this is the thing I want to select from this and put into my work and learn from it and build on it. Um, instead of like, um, I don't know, like overthinking and like trying to make one thing very perfectly, you get to like explore all these different, like multiple avenues at once and like so quick. Um, so I think it push it will push people to, um, to uh, I don't know, just play more, I guess. Like, I think that's exciting. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for answering that question about the future of arts as well. And thank you all so much for sharing about your practice and also talking amongst each other about the ceramics department and the apprenticeship. Um, if you haven't been to the art, art Center yet to see the exhibition by Tran Tran, it is on view through November 24th, and we do have our hours listed on our website, so do make sure that you come and check it out in our Cleve Carney Gallery and um, the beautiful black walls that are prepared or painted to complement the work as well. Um, definitely also uh, Lola has work up right now also at Arts and Public Life. Um, do check that out as well too. She's also in residence there. And we do have a couple of events coming up um, soon. We have our Center Sundays on November 7th from 1 to 5 p.m. Um, Rot and Grow featuring hands-on artist workshops and tastings on growing and preserving and accessing food. We'll have uh, workshops from Erica Dudley and our visiting international artist, Biermet uh, Buraveda. 
And we also have an empty bowls event following where our ceramics department graciously helped us make numbers and numbers of bowls so that we could help raise funds to give groceries to those in need centered around our Alain Tuazan exhibition Future Fossil Sum, and that's also November 7th from three to five. Bowls will be available for purchase for $25 to $50. And we're gonna have some amazing, amazing soup, soups from Detroit-based chef, activist, and artist, Ben Hall. Um, so definitely check that out. Those are on our website and we hope to see you at the Art Center soon. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you, Sierra. Thank you all. Thank you, Sierra. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Take care. <laughs>